All right, so we're going to talk about aldehyde and ketones. And um, we're going to talk about the nomenclature, how to name these, some reactions, and then some properties of both aldehydes and ketones. And we're going to learn the difference between the two. They're very similar. So again, this page, I checked off every functional group that we've learned. So we're going to focus on these two today. And so first, uh, let's talk about what they actually are. All right, so aldehydes and ketones, why are we learning them in the same lesson? Because they both contain a carbonyl group. Okay, so they're similar in this regard. All right, so what is a carbonyl group? It is simply a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Okay, if you have that, then you have either aldehyde or a ketone. So if you look at the figures on the bottom, figure A is the carbonyl group, the carbon double bond O. It doesn't really matter what the other two things are, as long as they're not oxygen or nitrogen. Um, if it's another carbon, if it's hydrogen, it doesn't matter. B, you would have an aldehyde. And C, you have a ketone. So do you see the difference between aldehydes and ketones? An aldehyde has a hydrogen and a carbon chain attached to the carbon with the double bond. Whereas a ketone does not have a hydrogen, it has two carbon chains that can be same or different, okay? Meaning that an aldehyde is something with the carbonyl group on the terminal carbon, on the carbon at the end. So that means the carbon has a hydrogen and the chemical symbol is CHO. Um, it doesn't mean carbon is bonded to hydrogen and then hydrogen is bonded to oxygen. No, it means carbon double bond, oxygen, carbon single bond, hydrogen. That's just the way that we write it. If you write COH, then you will have an alcohol. Okay, so CHO stands for aldehyde. Well, ketones, you will still have a carbonyl group, except you're now in a middle carbon. So that carbon with the uh, double bond O, it has two other carbons bonded to it. So the symbol will be R, single bond, CO, single bond, R. Okay, the CO represents the carbon and the double bond, O. So that's how you tell the difference between aldehydes and ketones. It's basically the location of your carbonyl group. So let's name some aldehydes, and, um, and then we'll name ketones later. As with always, you identify the longest chain first. And this chain must contain the carbonyl group. You can't identify the longest chain and realize, wait a minute, I don't have the carbonyl. You must include the carbonyl. That if you can't get the longest chain, then so be it. Okay, the longest chain with the carbonyl. And then you number so that the carbonyl is always carbon one. There isn't an ambiguity here. It has to be carbon one and no other number. Well, because that carbon must be found on a terminal carbon at the end, it's either the first carbon or the last carbon. And obviously, it's a functional group, so high priority has to be the first carbon. The name of the compound has to end with AL for aldehyde. And you don't need to tell me where the carbonyl is because it is implied to be carbon one always. If it's not carbon one, you're not an aldehyde. And then, of course, you just tell me all, all the other branches. All right, so let's do this one. The longest, the longest chain will be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. You must count from the aldehyde because of the rule that aldehyde has to have the smallest number. It has to have one. Five carbons in total. So this is pentanal. Okay, you don't need the one. So that would be a 2-propyl on carbon 2. You have 30 carbons, just simply put that together. 2-propyl, pentanal. That's it. Okay, no space again. This is actually quite simple. Naming aldehyde is one of the easiest ones to name. So I'm going to go ahead and give you some time to work on these two. I'll give you around two minutes, and then I'll take this up. Okay. So the first one is ridiculously simple. Four carbons, there's a double bond O on, well, on the terminal carbon. 
So that is just good to know. That's it. Okay, you don't need the one, you don't need anything. The next one, um, that one is a little bit more tricky. You gotta count. And you will, of course, count like this. You start at the double bond. Oh, you go one, two, three, four, five. So there are five carbons in total. That's penta now. That's the parent. So now it's just a matter of naming the substituents. So that's the two ethyl, five bromo, five chloro. You put it together, E before, um, sorry, uh, B before C before E. So you get five bromo, five chloro, two ethyl, pentanol. Okay, we clear about that, guys? Wait, why is it butanol? Why is the one on top butanol? Uh, wait, I can't. All carbons? Did you count five? Yeah. Right. All right, so this is kind of confusing. What if you have multiple different functional groups? Okay, it's like that example right there, you have an aldehyde and an alcohol. What do you do? Right, so that would be a very difficult question. Now, the rule, if you have multiple functional groups, is that, well, there is priorities between the functional groups. You see what I mean? We still have to number the carbon so that the higher priority functional group has the lowest number and the other functional group that doesn't have the highest priority, it's been relegated to a substituent. So we consider that to be now a substituent instead of a functional group. Does that make sense? In this case, carbonyl groups have higher priority than hydroxyl groups. So, you can either count this from the left or from the right, but because aldehydes have higher priority than alcohol, you start from the left, okay? And then this would be hexanal. You just name this as if it is an aldehyde. Let's look at the branches that it has. It has a three methyl. On carbon five, it has an alcohol, and the alcohol now becomes just a substituent, just like benzene becomes phenyl, that becomes hydroxy. So that's five hydroxy because it's a hydroxyl group. You put this together, H before M, so five hydroxy, three methyl hexanol. Does that make sense? The higher priority functional group becomes the boss, and this whole thing is named around that, and the other lower functional groups become just normal branches. Now you might have the question, wait, so how do I know which functional group has a higher priority? Well, we have a list. No, do not need to memorize this list at all, but just know that there is a list, and if I were to ever ask you a question with multiple functional groups, the list will be provided. So basically on the list, uh, carboxylic acid, we didn't learn that before, that's number one. And then you have amide, and then you have aldehyde. So those are the top three. Ketone is lower than aldehyde, and then you have alcohol, and then you have amine, which we didn't learn. And finally, you can see that thing we did learn, alkenes and alkynes, they have equal priority. And then you have alkanes, and then you have halo. Actually, um, halo and alkanes are they're the same priority. I don't know why it's listed like that. Um, I guess I copied this from somewhere. I just never bother changing it. But yeah, you know that alkanes and alkyl halides, they have the same priority because it's alphabetically not determined uh, who goes first. So just know that you gotta follow the hierarchy. The higher one will become the boss. The lower one will become basically just a branch. Okay, do we have any questions about that? Cool, all right. Let's move on to naming ketones. What the hell are you chewing? Just a sec. What are you doing? Don't need that book. What are you doing? Here. Stop chewing that. Uh, you know. All right, so anyway, naming ketones. Um, ketones are just like out of high, you have a double bond O but it has to be in a middle carbon, not a terminal carbon. So you just also find the longest chain that has the carbonyl. 
then you number the chain so that the carbonyl has the lowest number possible. Okay, it's not going to be carbon one. I'll tell you that because if it's carbon one, it's going to be an aldehyde. So make sure that it is as low as possible. And then you change the name to own, O-N-E. If it has more than five or five, then you have to specify where the carbonyl is. Okay, of all the numbers, why don't you five? Well, if you think about it, if you just have one carbon, you're not having a ketone. Ketone has to be in the middle. If you have one carbon, there is no middle. Two carbon, same thing. There's no way you're a ketone. Three carbon, you can be in the middle, but you have only one possible place to be, the middle on carbon two, so you don't need the number. Only when it starts at carbon five do you have ambiguities. Okay, so that's why at carbon five, you need to tell me where is the ketone. And then you find the other branches. Okay, so let's see this in action with that example right there. You count the carbons, obviously, from the right because that will give you the smallest ketone. You see what, what I'm saying? So that's pentan two own. You need the two because it could be on carbon three for all that matters. So it's on carbon two. You gotta tell me it's on carbon two. And of course you need the an as pentanone without the two. So you need the an to make it sound nice. 5-bromo, 4-methyl, put it together, you have 5-bromo, 4-methyl, pentatoon-ohm. You, uh, you guys good with that? All right, so I have two examples here. Just quickly uh, name these and then we can move on. Two minutes. All right, so the first one. Four carbons with a carbonyl, that's very easy, um, it's good to know. You don't need to tell me the two, because it has to be on two. Okay, if it's on carbon three, then you count it wrong. It's on carbon two. And of course, it can't be on carbon one or four. Uh, if it's on carbon one, it's an aldehyde. If it's on carbon four, well, you count it wrong, and it's an aldehyde. The next one, um, you can either count from the left or from the right you will obviously count from the right because you want the carbonyl to be as small as possible. And in this case, it's a three. So you have hexan three ohm, you have a two bromo and a four bromo and a five methyl. Putting all of this together, bromo before methyl, you have two four, dibromo, five methyl, hexan three ohm. Okay, I hope you all got something like that. The next two are um, also pretty simple. Um, let's just do this one quickly together. The first one, you have a ring and a ketone. What do you want to call that? Anyone? Nobody? You can't just do that in your head real quick. You have six in a ring. Cyclohexa. Wait, yeah, cyclohexanol. Yes, yeah, cyclohexanol. That's it. Cyclo for the ring. Hexa six carbon. Oh, that's it. You don't need to tell me the one because it's in the ring. And it's obviously got to be one, right? The next one is also a simple one. Uh, I'm just gonna show you this. You count from the left, obviously, and you must go to the chlorine. You can't go up because if you go up, you're gonna miss out on the chlorine. So you always count so that you hit all the branches. You don't want a branch on top of a branch. If you do that, well, that's pentatuum, three ethyl, four methyl, five chloro, putting it all together, C before E before M, you have a five chloro, three ethyl, four methyl, pentan two O. All right, so do we have any questions regarding naming ketones and aldehydes? Yeah, how do we know that first one is a ketone and not an aldehyde? Because technically it's... Right. The first one, cyclohexanone, is a ketone, not an aldehyde because of... What the hell are you doing? Hold up, my, my dog is tearing stuff up. What the hell? 
Yeah, that one is a ketone. Because the definition of a ketone says that the carbon with the double bond O must be bonded to two other carbons. You see, an aldehyde has to be on a terminal carbon. That means that it's the last or the first carbon, so it has to have a hydrogen on it. This one doesn't. Does that make sense? Okay, so basically just because it's not on a, a carbon with no other carbon, with only one other carbon. Yeah, exactly. So if you're in a ring, you've got to be a ketone. There's no way you're not a hug. What if you have like um, the the oxygen on, say, a carbon, but then the carbon has a random atom attached to it, like a chlorine or something as well? That would be. Oh, that's a good question. Um, that would be an aldehyde because it's a terminal carbon. It doesn't have to be hydrogen as long as it's terminal carbon. Okay. That makes sense, right? Yeah. Oh, right. So let's look at the properties of aldehydes and ketones. Well, because they have oxygen, okay, so they are polar. Now, if you're polar, then you have dipole dipole force, meaning that you will have a higher boiling point than alkanes. But because alcohols have hydrogen bonding and aldehydes and ketones do not, they will have a lower boiling point than alcohol. So if you look at the table, Ethanol, two carbon alcohol, boiling point 78. And then now a two carbon aldehyde, the boiling point is only 21. Okay, so it's obviously lower than the alcohol. And ethane, the gas, has a negative boiling point. And if you look at three carbon ones, uh, propan one all, I know that says one propanol. Um, there are old ways of naming and new ways of naming. You know, because we're uh, young and hip, we're going to go with the new way, propan one all. That's one propanol is the older IUPAC name, but this, um, this table uses the old way. Same thing. So one propanol or propanol one all, 97. Propanol, same number of carbons, same number of oxygen. It's just that, you know, one has a double bond and one doesn't. Well, this one drops to 49 because it's polar, but non hydrogen bonding. And propanone being the ketone, same thing, around 50, uh, 56. So they're in the same ballpark as aldehydes, but a lot lower than alcohol. And the pattern persists, it's just continuum. Uh, one butanol, the alcohol, 118, but the uh, butanol, the aldehyde and the ketone, a lot lower, okay? And you need to know why this is lower due to the fact that it is just polar, not hydrogen bonding. Do you have any questions? All right. All right, so some properties um, aside from a boiling point. Methanol is something that I'm sure most people have heard of. Formaldehyde or formalin, uh, that's the um, common name. And if you've done a dissection, you know what that smells like. Um, usually the specimen comes in drenched in formaldehyde to preserve the body parts so that you know, microorganisms don't you know, decompose that. And um, it, the hospitals usually have this smell. Um, also, if you uh, go to a place where they store bodies, if you want to store them for a long time, well, you, you have to have this. And um, just for your curiosity, at the University of Toronto, the St. George campus, there is a room under the medical building. And you can actually just access that room. Like, I used to go down there you know, just to visit. That room is actually a study room. If you just can go to the basement, just make a turn. It looks like there was a science lab in a horror movie. You go into one of these doors, there are desks in there. There are people studying in there. But what's so special about that room is along the walls, uh, you have a lot of body parts. Like these are real body parts. Okay, you can have, you, there's every single body part in there. There's, there's one that stuck out, it was half of a skull. Well, somebody did stuck. You'll cut in half right here. One side is the face, the other side is the insides. All the body parts you can imagine are in vials, little jars with formaldehyde around the room. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, I used to go down there once in a while just to marvel at the body parts. 
And I used to joke that at U of T, you either graduate or you end up here. So anyway, um, these, they can dissolve a lot of different types of solids. Again, because mostly they have a polar part. And if you have a long carbon chain, you also have a non-polar part. So it has a lot of versatility when it comes to dissolving. So propanone, we actually call it acetone. Okay, that's the common name, but the actual IUPAC name is propanone. So I'm sure people heard of acetone, but not propanone. Same thing. If you ever put on nail polish, and um, well, nail polish is not supposed to come off with water. Otherwise, the next time you wash your face, there goes your nail polish, right? That wouldn't make sense. So you need a special fluid to remove the nail polish. And you know, people that use nail polish will know this. That's acetone. Okay, basically you just take a, a little cotton and you just put some on and you start wiping your nails and only with acetone will nail polish come off. The reason is that nail polish is non-polar. Well, it doesn't mix with water. Water wouldn't wash it off because water is polar, nail polish is non-polar, they don't mix. Okay, so only non-polar can get rid of non-polar and acetone has non-polar components it is a polar molecule, but it has two methyl groups. So because it has really you know, good ability to dissolve polar and non-polar substances, that's the thing we use. Okay, you're not using oil because you know, that, that's disgusting and that doesn't mix with water, but this does mix with water and it can get rid of fingernail polish, okay? If there, wait, if aldehydes and ketones are good at dissolving things, how come the body parts don't dissolve in formaldehyde? No, no, by dissolve, I don't mean break down. Like acids, they quote unquote dissolve things. Now we're using the word dissolve very loosely. In a strict chemistry terms, dissolve means, you know, water or something surrounds it and it doesn't break it down. You just can't see it anymore because you know, it's broken into ions or it's been surrounded by water or another molecule so that they're separated. Does that make sense? That's dissolve, the dissociation reaction or the ionization reaction. Okay. The um, acids, they do something different. They react. Okay, I know we use dissolve for acid. Well, look, this dissolves in the acid. We're not using the word dissolve properly if we use that word. That's the common way of saying it. That's a good question. Does that make sense? Kind of. All right, so let's look at some reactions. Um, if you want to make aldehydes and ketones, you can, you can synthesize this from alcohol. All you have to do is oxidize that alcohol. Okay, and well, the word oxidized, you've heard probably many times before. It has different definitions. There are many ways to oxidize something, and the definition we're gonna go with with organic chem is the gain of oxygen or a loss of hydrogen. Okay, if you gain oxygen, you are oxidized. That's where the word comes from, okay? And if you lose hydrogen, so you don't have to gain oxygen. If you just lose some hydrogen, you're still oxidized. Okay, the reason for that is more complicated. Why is it still called oxidation? Well, we were supposed to learn oxidation in unit five, electrochemistry, but since we don't have enough time, you know, that's been scrapped. Good luck in university, okay? Um, we're gonna go with the organic chemistry version of this, gaining oxygen or losing hydrogen. Both of these are oxidation reactions. Well, how would that work? There will be an oxidizing agent. Something that oxidizes other things is called an oxidizing agent. For example, uh, potassium permanganate, okay, KMnO4. It doesn't have to be that, it could be potassium dichromate. As long as you have a lot of oxygen on you, you can be an oxidizing agent. You don't have to worry about the mechanism of this. Um, basically, this shows you that the oxidizing agent supplies the oxygen, and the oxygen will somehow rip off two hydrogens from your molecule to make water, and then you lose two hydrogens. Thus, they're oxidized. And then now you're forced to make a double bond because you're missing two hydrogen. You've got to make up for that bond, so you make a double bond. So that's how you get an aldehyde from an alcohol. Now, I don't know how clear this picture is, but I have the diagram version here. All right, we use bracket O to represent the oxidizing agent. 
That is not the formula, obviously. We don't care about the formula of the compound. We just care about the fact that this supplies oxygen, so we just represent it with O. You have an alcohol, okay, plus the oxidizing agent. You will synthesize an aldehyde or a ketone. It depends on where the alcohol is. So the oxygen atom will remove two hydrogen. One of the hydrogen will be from the OH, okay? The other hydrogen will be from the adjacent carbon atom, the carbon atom that has the OH. So losing that two hydrogen, the carbon atom and the oxygen atom, they're both missing a bond. They will make a double bond. Thus, an aldehyde or ketone is produced. Okay, and also water is a byproduct of this. The oxidizing agent will just create water because the oxygen took two hydrogens. And if you do this with a primary alcohol, that means an alcohol found on the terminal carbon, you will get an aldehyde because you're on the terminal carbon. See how this works? If you do this, oh, well, okay, I highlight that right there. So those two hydrogens will go with that oxygen to make that water molecule specifically right there. And then the carbon and the oxygen will make a double bond. Now, if you have a secondary alcohol, meaning that your alcohol is attached to a carbon that has two other carbons on it, but one of them is hydrogen, you will have a ketone. So, highlighted in blue, the hydrogen from the oxygen and from the carbon, they will be ripped off by that oxygen to make water, and a double bond will be formed. That will be propanol. Okay? Now, if you have a tertiary alcohol, though, that means an alcohol on a carbon with three other carbons, so no hydrogens at all, there will be no reaction. Now, why not? Because that carbon will have no hydrogen to lose. You're not going to oxidize anything. You can't make a double bond because you already have four bonds. Okay, so tertiary alcohols cannot be oxidized. That doesn't work. So primary makes aldehyde, secondary makes ketone, tertiary, no reaction. You guys good? All right. Um, you can, of course, do the opposite. You can do an addition reaction, a hydrogenation reaction. So you would get aldehyde back into alcohol, ketone back into alcohol. Okay, and the type of alcohol depends on whether it's an aldehyde and ketone. So aldehyde make primary alcohol. Ketones, well, they make secondary alcohols. So I'm going to give you some time to work on example four. Draw the structural formulas and write the IUPAC names to represent the controlled oxidation of an alcohol to form butanol. So you know that the final product is butanol. You need to figure out what alcohol will get you butanone and draw the alcohol. Okay, so I'll give you around two minutes for this, and I'll take that up very, very shortly. All right, so first off, um, you have to work backwards from this question. You're given the final product, the butanone, so draw the butanone. That's how you would draw that. Four carbons with a double bond on a middle carbon because it's a ketone. And then you ask yourself, what possible alcohol can make this? And well, obviously, that the OH group has to be on the second carbon, right? And that's how you would know. That would be that alcohol right there. So that would be butanol. If you oxidize this thing, you would get butanol. Okay, you good? When you draw this, you do not have to include the hydrogens. I am including the hydrogens because I want this to be clear. So you have to see that there is a hydrogen on the carbon that can be oxidized with. But if you do decide to draw with the hydrogen, make sure you have the correct number of hydrogens. If you miss or have extra hydrogens, you will lose marks. Okay, so I suggest you draw the skeleton structure. All right, next. Oh, wait, it does say to write the IUPAC name, doesn't it? I just forgot the name. Yeah, that would be butan 2 o So 
Example five, draw the structure diagrams and write the IPAC names to illustrate the hydrogenation of propanone. All right, so I'll give you some time on this one. So this time you do the opposite. You have propanone, you hydrogenate that, and if you add hydrogen to get the final product, which should be an alcohol. Okay, so I'll give you around uh, two minutes. All right, so you have propanone and you need to add some hydrogens to make it an alcohol. Well, here's propanone. Propa for three carbons, it's a, it's a ketone, so it must be on carbon two. That's what you get. Now you add hydrogen and all you have to do really is just to slap the hydrogen on the oxygen and the central carbon and you will get that. Okay, so that will be a propan two O. So that or isopropyl alcohol, so, um, they're the same thing, but let's just go with the proper IUPAC name, propan 2 o And again, like I said, you don't need to show the hydrogens, but if you do, you make sure that they're the correct number. And so you just insert hydrogens to make four bonds total. All right, so this should conclude the lesson. Uh, we learned about aldehydes and ketones. We learn how to name them. Uh, we know the difference between them. And we learn how to make these and some properties. Do we have questions about this lesson? Well, I'm not hearing any questions, so I'm going to end this here.